The objective of this video is to introduce the area product method for designing high frequency transformers. We're also going to comment at the end of the video how it can be adapted to designing inductors. So on the right hand side of the screen, I've drawn two images for transformers. And starting with the top image, we can note a few features about this. First is that I've, I've sketched in here um, the mean path length that our field takes. And when you pick out a core, this is an important property of the core. You can estimate the mean path length, but mean path length by looking at the geometry and taking the mean path as you'd expect your field to take. Another dimension that we should label on here is our core area. So the core area is the cross-sectional area that the flux flows through. And finally, we can note that in the center here, we call this we call this the window of the core. So this is the window area. So this particular transformer has two coils, each with a certain number of turns, NP turns and NS turns, and this matches the nomenclature and the and the drawing all match our discussion from our previous video on transformer analysis. Down below here, I'm showing a variant which is composed of two split core sections. We have an E core pressed up against an I core, and then we now have two window areas where the winding is located, and I've sketched in here a bobbin that we've wound the winding upon before inserting in here. So we've 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 placed our coil in this bobbin and then we've slid it onto the E core and then we've applied the, the I core on top. And so if we were to physically look at what this is gonna, going to look like, on our bobbin we're going to see a bunch of individual dis discrete conductors all, all smushed into here. And these conductors will wrap out of the page and then return down here below. And so we have a bunch of discrete copper conductor cross sections filling up this window area. And a, a feature to notice here is that in this core, our field will actually take two parallel paths. So we'll have a portion of field that will go like this. And we'll have a portion of field that will go like this. And so because of that, you end up having twice the flux in the central region, so you have this region right here has to carry twice the flux as compared to the regions out here. And so that center area ends up having twice the core cross-sectional area as the regions elsewhere in this core. Okay, so that was a little review of the geometry. Let's now get into the design of the transformer. This lecture is again a design lecture, which means we're solving an inverse problem. We previously talked about what these kind of problems look like at the beginning of the course when we were designing the single phase rectifier. So the inverse problem, the design problem, you start with your end in mind. You say, hey, I want to have a transformer that has a certain voltage in the primary, a certain voltage in the secondary. When it's at rated conditions, it carries a certain current in the primary and the secondary. And it switches, it's being designed to operate with a converter that's going to have a certain switching frequency. And then you work backwards to figure out how to dimension all the aspects of your, of your transformer. So we'll specify the primary voltage, the secondary voltage, the primary and secondary current in terms of their RMS values, and the switching frequency that we're going to operate this thing at. And we're making an assumption when we do this design about the shape of our input voltage. We're assuming that our input voltage, VP, is a square wave as it would be with the full bridge converter that we've been talking about. So we're assuming that under rated conditions, this is our VP waveform as a period of our switching frequency. And then the half period is our switching frequency divided by two, the switching period divided by two. And it's symmetric. So it has a positive peak of VP and a negative peak of, v, of negative VP. And so we can use Faraday's law to calculate what the flux linkage of our primary coil is. If VP has this value, we can use Faraday's law to calculate the flux linkage. And assuming that our flux linkage has no average value, we're going to get 
a shape that looks like this. Okay, so we've made this set of assumptions and we've used Faraday's law to show how uh, the flux linkage in our primary coil is going to be related to this, this assumed square waveform of VP. And I want to note briefly that the reason that we've assumed that VP is a square waveform is because we're assuming that we're using that bridge converter where the primary voltage is equal to the throw voltage, either the positive throw voltage or the negative throw voltage. So we're saying that our, that our full bridge is going to be either all the way on for, or all the way up reversed. So we're either going to be applying the positive throw voltage or the negative throw voltage at any instant of time. And we'll come back and develop um, how that full bridge converter works and, and why this may or may not be true in a separate lecture. But for now, this is our assumption in order for us to design our transformer. So the design process for the transformer can be summarized as three steps. And those three steps are, first, we select the transformer core we're going to use. If it's one of these split cores, it could also be a toroidal core. It could be a solenoid. Um, there are many options. It could be a coaxial transformer. We've shown you pictures of split cores because they're very common, but there are many options for what that core can be. So first, we select the core. Second, we select the wire that we're going to use. And then finally, we determine how many turns of wire we need. OK, so we're going to now write out a series of relationships based on our transformer analysis that we've previously done. We're going to use this to build up to an expression that helps us select the core of the transformer. And our first expression is actually talking about wire. We can calculate the cross section of one of the wires. So I'm talking about one of these, one of these orange dots in here. So we can calculate the wire cross-section as being the current that our wire has to carry, IP, or actually IP RMS, divided by an allowable current density, Jm. And Jm is in, in units of amps RMS per millimeter squared. So on the right-hand side of the screen, we're going to write out a series of design, we're going to list a series of design constants as we go through this derivation. And the very, we've now at our first constant, which is this theoretical current density. And so what we do in order to design a transformer is that we say that we're going to have a maximum current density that we're going to allow our conductors to carry. And we do this because of heating concerns. If we, if we let the current density be too high, we're going to have a large loss concentration and we won't be able to get the heat out before we melt the insulation of our wire. So typical values for air-cooled transformers are to have a current density in the range of 3 to 5 amps RMS per millimeter squared. And this could be viewed as a design input. This is something that you're, you are just declaring my transformer under rated conditions is going to have this current density and then we use it to make calculations to back solve calculations in order to dimension our transformer. So the first of these these constraints is that you have to have specified a maximum allowable current density or a rated current density. Okay, so we can work with this a little bit more and we can come up with an expression for the required window area size. So remember the window area is this region where the, all the, the conductor cross sections reside. So it's this, this region here or this down here And so we're saying that the required window area is going to be equal to the number of primary turns times the wire cross-sectional area of each primary conductor plus the number of secondary turns times the cross-sectional area of each secondary conductor. So this seems logical, but in fact, this is not the whole story. You need to divide this by this factor called Kw. And Kw is the window fill factor. The window fill factor is a fraction indicating how much of this window space you can actually fill with copper. So at first you might say, why not 100%? Well, the truth of the matter is that you can see these discrete conductors in here. 
Well, they're circular and they've got some insulation on them. So when you try to shove them into that window area, they butt up against each other and they don't fill all the available space and the insulation further degrades how much actual copper is in that area. So this wind window fill factor is yet another constant that we assume in our design process. And a, a typical reasonably conservative value is about 30%. So that means that we can only use about 30% of our window area for actual copper. In practice, you can obtain values of up to 70%. It's possible, but it's very, very difficult. So if you're trying to get a very high window fill factor, you're going to be looking at some kind of alternative manufacturing technique. Maybe you're looking at a, a rectangular conductor instead of a circular conductor. Um, things that make your design very expensive. So typically, a value in the range of 30% to maybe 50% is something that you can achieve um, w with standard equipment. Okay, so this expression for window area can be written in terms of the coil currents by using our first expression. So this is a key equation that we will be using throughout this video. Next, we're going to use Faraday's law. We're going to go back to this relation up here that we wrote out in terms of relating our, our voltage to our flux linking our primary coil. So if we integrate VP over the period TS by 2, so we're talking about this period here or this period here, we see that our flux goes from having its negative extreme value up to having its positive extreme value. That is, we, tra we traverse from negative lambda peak to positive lambda peak, or in other words, it's equal to the ripple in our flux linkage, which is 2 times the maximum value of our flux linkage. If you go back to our transformer analysis video, you can plug in quantities here. Remember that flux linkage is equal to the number of turns times the core flux times the flux in our core. So that's the physical flux that's taking this contour here. And then recall that flux is just equal to area times field. So we've now arrived at our third design constraint, which is that we're going to specify an assumed maximum field in our core for rated conditions. Okay, so just like we had a maximum current density, we're also going to have a maximum flux density. And typically, we're going to pick a value for this that's going to be less than one Tesla. In fact, we know that steel has a certain saturation level where you start to leave the linear region. And we pick B max typically to be far less than that value. And we do this for a couple of reasons. One is that we want to have a very linear characteristic. But perhaps the most dominating and most important reason is has to do with core losses. The Steinmetz equations give us an expression for the losses that we get in our core as a function of the peak AC field that we have. So when you, when you, when you magnetize and demagnetize a core, which is what you're doing when you have an AC field, you're, you're causing all the, the little magnetic dipoles to, to align and then disalign as you go from zero Tesla up to one Tesla down to zero Tesla to negative tes one Tesla. And this causes some loss to happen. Uh, this makes sense, right? You're, you're actually physically orienting uh, things within the steel, little dipoles within the steel, and this requires some energy to do that. And that is a loss in your system. And so the amount of energy that you lose due to this has to do, it is directly proportional to the frequency that you're switching at and it has a nonlinear dependence on the, the peak of the magnetic field that you're, that you're traversing. So for this reason, this is a long explanation for just saying that we pick B max to be less than B sat, and a, and a typical rule of thumb is, is less, less than one Tesla, maybe close to a Tesla, but less than a Tesla. So again, inverted design problem. We've assumed a B max, and then we use that assumption for what we, what we will have as what we will actually have in our field, in our core, to calculate quantities. So that's why it appears in this equation here. 
so let's now rewrite this equation. We can extract, um, we can evaluate this integral and we can note that Ts over two is actually equal to one over two Fs, where Fs is our switching frequency. So if we do this, we get one over two Fs Vp. And we got this expression. We can then solve for the number of turns. So we can solve this equation for NP. And we now have an expression for our turns that depends on the voltage that we want our converted operate at or our transformer to operate on the primary, the core cross-sectional area, the switching frequency, and the maximum field that we're going to allow in our core. And we can equivalently do this for NS, the number of turns in our secondary, in terms of our assumed secondary voltage or our design input for the secondary voltage. Okay, so we have these two expressions and these are also key important expressions. So now what we're going to do is we're going to plug our expression for NP and NS into this expression for the area of our window. So if we do that, we get the following. And we now have this expression, and I want you to notice that, it, that we can identify these two terms up here as being the power through the transformer. Assuming that we have no losses, the, power, the input power is equal to the output power, and the input power is equal to our input voltage times our RMS current, and similarly for our output power is our output voltage times our RMS current. So P is, is physically meaning full to us in terms of in terms of our design spec p is the power throughput rating of the transformer that we are trying to design and we're now going to do something that's kind of bizarre we're going to define a term called the area product and we'll call it ap the area product is equal to the product of the window area and the core area so if we take this expression right here and we multiply this by AC, we have our area product. And you can see that we simply have AC in the denominator. So this is a very easy operation. We'll just rewrite it down below and make use of the power, the P's, and the fact that we have two P in the numerator, which cancels four to be down to two. So if we write this out, we have this expression for area product. So at first pass, this may seem nonsensical. Why would we multiply two areas by themselves? We get millimeters to the fourth. What does that even mean? Well, you can see that, that upon inspection of this equation, it's, it's actually rather interesting. The product of the window area and the core area is dependent purely on our design spec and our design constants. We have in here our power rating, which is our design spec, our switching frequency, also the design spec, and then a series of design constants, which are the maximum field we're going to allow in our core, window fill factor, and the maximum current density that we're going to allow in our conductors. And so what you do when you design a transformer using this approach is that you evaluate the area product using this equation, and then you go to a core manufacturer and you look up in their catalog which cores have the correct area product for your specification. So notice that the area product doesn't actually tell us uniquely what the area is for the window versus the cross section. It tells us that it doesn't matter as long as you multiply their areas together and you come up with this answer. So you could have a very small window and a very large core, or you could have a very small core and a very large window. And to this very crude first order approximation, it doesn't matter. In all actuality, it does matter that you have your system well dimensioned or you'll get too much leakage flux or you won't be able to actually manufacture and fit conductors in places you want to fit them in. But to a first order approximation, uh, th this relationship holds and the core manufacturers go to great lengths to make their cores, uh, to make their core dimensions be optimized so that they function within this area product concept. So if you pick out one of their cores that has the area product for design, they have put some thought into how they've actually dimensioned their window versus their core area so that it is a, a, a reasonable design for what you are trying to build. And 
the second thing that the area product does is it gives you some insight into how you scale your design. So we can say that you use your area product to complete step one of, your, of the design process. And so recall, we said that the design process consists of three steps. First, selecting the core, second, selecting wire, and third, selecting the number of turns. So step one, evaluate AP, and then go to, go to a core manufacturer, look in their catalog to determine a core that has your area product. Step two is wire selection. Wire selection means that you take your terminal current and you divide it by your current density and you get the cross-sectional area for a conductor. You then go and fit this to a standard wire gauge. And so we can note that if our, wire if our frequency, our electrical frequency is very high, we might find that the skin depth of the wire that this equation gives us is too small. It's smaller than the, than the diameter of our conductor. And in that case, we will put several conductors in parallel where each conductor has a diameter that is smaller than the skin depth. So now we've selected a core, we've determined a gauge of wire to use. Now we need to determine the number of turns. And that is as simple as using the NP and NS equations that we had on this page right here. But note that those equations can give you fractional numbers, so you need to round them to the nearest integer. So this is the whole story. This outlines the design process. I want to point out a modification that can be made based on whether you're designing a transformer or an inductor and uh, if you have a different voltage waveform. So right now, as we've described it, we've assumed that we had a voltage waveform on our primary that had a 50% duty ratio and was always equal to our throw voltage. If you have something else, you need to go and modify this expression right here. So you modify this as needed based on your voltage waveform. Or in the case of an inductor, you replace using Faraday's law with Ampere's law. So in, in the case of an inductor, you have specified what inductance you want. And so you can use lambda is equal to Li in order to get this relation here. So you get, end up having NP and NS in terms of the desired inductance and the peak current instead of being in terms of VS or VP. And actually, I, I said that wrong. So in an inductor, you only have one coil. You don't have two coils, so you only have NP. There is no concept of NS because you only have one coil. And so you'd end up with an expression for your number of turns in terms of your inductance and current instead of in terms of a voltage. So that concludes this video. In summary, we have introduced the well-known area product method for designing high frequency transformers. And we've talked about how to pose a design problem in terms of inputs, as well as design constants that stay fixed. So these were things like your current density, your window fill factor, and your flux density. And we've outlined the process, the three steps we have to take in order to design a transformer. We've derived key expressions that are used in the design. And finally, we culminated in this expression for an area product, which we can use to select the core of our transformer. And then we've, we've talked about how you can modify this area product method based on the wave shape of your input voltage or if it's an inductor.